Hello, welcome to Confessions of a Cleaning Business Owner. I'm Louise here with Diane. And today we are talking a few little snippets that you might like about PPE and about cleaning safely, because by the time this goes out, we will have done our Cleaning Safely webinar, which was free for everyone to attend. It is recorded and has been recorded for the last few years and is available to all DCBM members. But I think there's a few little snippets we'd like to talk about, because I think they might be quite interesting for domestic cleaners. So, Diane, where are we starting? Should we start with PPE? Because this is one of my favourite bits of the presentation when you do the glove presentation. And is it me that have, this? Yeah, and we always have a breakout room beforehand about how many gloves are needed in a, in a house clean. So can we talk about that first? So this is a tricky one, isn't it? Gloves. So let's talk about gloves first of all. So there are loads of different types of gloves, but they're not all equal. So what I didn't realise, I thoroughly realise now because I get to teach this stuff, is that when you buy disposable gloves, let's say, so you've got disposable and you've got reusable. So your disposable ones are basically the throwaway ones you can buy from Costco. There's loads of different types. And then there's your reusable. So your marigolds tend to be the main ones. You've got your gauntlet ones, which go right up the arms for oven cleaning. They're a lot thicker because um, they need to protect you for longer. And every glove is rated for its chemical resistance. So every glove will be chemically resistant for a certain amount of time. And your gauntlet ones for the ovens are a lot thicker because they need to protect you against a lot stronger chemicals for a lot longer. So, but then we go on to the disposable ones, which a lot of people use. And you will see carpet cleaners use nitrile gloves. They are chemical resistant for a lot longer. So they're at least 30 minutes. There are gloves out there like your latex ones, which a lot of people tend to be a bit more allergic to. They are not chemical resistant for as long as your nitrile ones. So a lot of people just think, oh, buy the cheapest gloves available. Well, that's not such a great idea. You know, you can buy really cheap gloves like the plastic ones you see in petrol stations. They are not going to protect you for very long at all. And they're going to break as well. Um, so yeah, yeah if you ever try. If it, I mean, we, we buy, we have the disposable ones. They're not all we use, but and they're vinyl rather than latex. But they give you no, very little protection really of doing any wet work because they literally go through so easily. They're designed for either under a pair of proper gloves or for use when you're doing dry cleaning. Yeah, they're not. You can tell straight away when you try using them for anything else. They the fingers go through really quickly on them. So you know straight away they're not giving you a lot of protection from the chemicals. And then we talk about double gloving, which you just mentioned there. So this is really, really common in hospitals so that they are potentially going to get sharps injuries. So it's much better to have two on for protection than one because it gives you a little bit more and also you can have really dirty outer gloves remove those without coming to any risk because you've still got your inner gloves the question for cleaning is it depends what you're doing as to whether you need gloves or not and i always find it interesting because we actually do a breakout room where we say well how many gloves do you need and a lot of people will come up to 16 pairs per house and we can talk through that but it depends what you're doing. If you are dusting with no chemicals, just damp and dry cloths, do you need gloves? Well, during COVID times, we were like, well, yes, you do. Because for health and safety reasons, either you are going to wash your hands between each room to stop cross-contamination or you dispose of the gloves between each room. So the room is probably not that much of a risk to you. But some people will still choose to wear gloves just because it makes them more aware. It stops them touching their face as much. There's a lot of reasons why you would wear gloves, but do you absolutely have to? Not if you're not using chemicals. Yeah, and it is. It's the chemicals that are the key here, aren't they? But then there's there's also an element of, you know, you're, you're collecting dirt from surfaces, even if you're doing it without chemicals. So you're potentially coming into contact with the dirt on your hands. And like you say, if you're wearing the gloves, it stops you touching your face as often. And, and it's actually shocking how often people will touch their face and, and transfer things without even realising we're doing it. And then, so this is my favourite part. And what shocks me about running through this exercise every time is how few people have thought it through. So I almost don't mind what your answer is, as long as you've thought it through and can tell me why your answer is what, you're, what it is. So when I say, how many gloves do you use in, the, in a house? Well, let's say the house has got two bathrooms. Do you need two pairs of gloves, one for each bathroom? Can you use the same pair of gloves for both? 
or each bathroom's got a toilet in. So actually, do you need one for the bathroom, one for the toilet, the next third pair for the next bathroom and the fourth one for the toilet? And I love seeing people debate this and talk through it. And so my attitude is, well, you could get away with wearing one pair per bathroom as long as you finished on the toilets and disposed of them straight away. But when people tell me they use one pair in the house and I'm like, right, so you do the bathroom finish with the toilet and then you're going to the kitchen with the toilet gloves. And they're like, oh, yeah, I suppose that happens. I clean the kitchen first and then I go to the bathroom. I'm like, but do you understand the kind of bacteria and pathogens we're finding in the kitchen is vastly different to what you're now bringing into the bathroom? And you want to keep the zones really quite separate. And I mean, the next thing that comes into all of this is obviously colour coding and actually zones. And I know we've talked at length with, again, Bix about this. There are different zones in a house where you find different pathogens, bacteria, and you do want to keep them separate. But you can tell me, Diane, colour coding, do you do it or not? We don't use colour coding. We discussed this previously, haven't we? We don't use colour coding because we don't transfer anything from one room to the other. So we don't need to use colour coding because we don't reuse anything. Having said that, when you're talking about gloves, now, yeah, disposable gloves, obviously you can dispose of them. But when you're talking about washable gloves, so your traditional rubber gloves, your marigolds or whatever, or whatever version of those, you can wash those as if you were washing your hands. Yeah. And this is what I think a lot of people don't realise. You don't realize. necessarily need five pairs in one house of those type of gloves because you can literally wash your hands while you've got them on. Yeah, you can wash your hands with soap, with gloves on, and that's exactly the same. And a lot of people don't realise that actually, you know, your hands, washing them is more effective than using disposable gloves. Yeah. And this is why I say I don't mind what the answer is as long as you can give me a convincing answer. Not that you have to answer to me, but, you know... <laughs> Um, but this brings us on. So I'll just cover colour codes, actually, for a second. So the British Institute of Cleaning Science has a lovely standard as to what they think each colour should mean. But there is no national standard. You can pick a colour for any zone as long as you teach it to all your staff and everyone does the same. So it tends to be red for bathroom, yellow for clinical waste, uh, green for kitchen, blue for your general areas and i think it's red and white for toilet yeah. is that right that's off the top of my head i should know this shouldn't i yeah now we do it slightly differently we use green and blue slightly differently i still use the same for the rest um it doesn't matter all my bottles are color coded the same all my cloths are color coded the same as long as your staff are taught it when you come if you do end up having a chat with your health and safety advisor it doesn't matter as long as it's standard through your company what I always find really interesting about the the, the colour coding in, in a domestic environment is when we come to wash the cloths, do they get washed separately or do they all get put into the same wash? So, yeah, we did used to wash them all together. We now wash them all separately. We've now gone the next step and we now keep them separate. And and that's the right practice because, you know, I have the conversation with people, oh, yeah, we use colour coding. And, and then, OK, so where do they go at the end of the day? Oh, they'll go in the washing machine. And I'm just like, well, what was the point of the colour coding? <laughs> Ours works just the same in that they all, you know, they're all bagged up after each room. But, yeah, that's the best practice with colour coding is you actually need to wash them separately. So do you know what always shocks me? And I hear time and time again from customers that other cleaners are getting through the house in just 10 cloths. Well, we're getting through for a team of two doing three or four houses a day, they're getting through a hundred cloths. And I'm like, okay, so, okay, a team of two on four houses. Well, we're using what, 25 cloths per house? But there are other cleaners, I'm going, how can you clean a house? And when we discuss it with them, and we do during some of these sessions, maybe not our free one tonight, I don't think we have time, but they're telling me how they can get through the house in eight cloths. And as soon as you start picking it apart, it, you can't, you literally cannot get through a house in eight cloths. Yeah, no, we our because we use cloth bags and it's a different cloth bag for every house. So if they're doing two houses or three houses that day, then they have three bags of cloths. And there's probably we don't count them, but there are about there's about 20 cloths in that bag. And that would be about normal for a house. And that would mean that they could cover any house. But some houses, they might not use them all. But certainly I'd be worried if they were only using eight. Yeah, it's it's quite scary. But this brings us on to, so we've talked about disposing of gloves. You'll also want to dispose, you might get through a Hoover bag. There are things that you, waste that you're going to produce as part of cleaning. And what a lot of cleaners are not aware of is that they actually need, I'm going to ask for your, because you like to look up the proper stuff here, the waste carrier license, isn't it? Yes. 
Yeah, and it's available in the UK. It's slightly different. It's still called a waste carrier license in Scotland, but it's a slightly different process for getting one. But it's free. But fundamentally, it's to cover you for dirt that you create as part of the cleaning. So that vacuum bag that's full of dust and goodness knows what, that is the waste that you've created while cleaning. So it's not removing customers' rubbish. You're not allowed to do that with this basic carrier's license, but it covers you for your dirty cloths and for your things like your vacuum bags. And it's free. So our sort of advice is always, isn't it, get one, because actually by law you need one whether you believe it or not. Yeah. And why not? It's free. It's a no brainer, isn't it? Um, so, yeah, it's different in Scotland. And if you want to know more, message us and we can tell you more and give you the links to the one in Scotland. But it's still free. But I'm going to reiterate what you've said there. Even with this, you cannot remove a bin bag or any waste from a customer's site ever. And you can't even take the bin bags outside, can you? Like we you can't take waste then there's a lot of dubiousness here. You're not supposed to take waste even into the outside shared bins of a flat. No, because that's that's not part of your client's house. If if it's a if it's a, a semi detached house and they've got the bin in the garden, you can you can take the rubbish out and put it in the bin. But if it's a communal area bin store for like say a block, block of flats, you're kind of coming off the client's premises. You are then taking that waste and carrying it, and you're not allowed to do that. And there was a case recently, someone on one of our groups where they said, well, it didn't fit in the bin. So I left it next to it where there was already a pile of bin bags. Someone saw them doing it. And because they're a business, they're now liable. They're going to court with the council because they fly tipped. And they yeah. did. And they don't have a waste carrier's license to actually take somebody else's rubbish away. So, yeah. And that's a paid for one. And even to be fair, even that, if you are doing it, is not incredibly expensive. But we all need the free one regardless. OK, so I hope anyone listening to this gets straight on. Go and have a look for your waste carrier's license. Now, on to another one that we cover at great length. And we've just done a podcast on this. What's the difference between your supermarket chemicals and your professional chemicals? Well, for me, because I'm always talking about money, is the price. Secondly, they are safer for you to use day in, day out. The professional products are. Yeah. So the big one, obviously, the price. And the reason it's cheaper is because you're not buying plastic each time. You're not using your single use plastic. So you're buying it from concentrate. So you're not paying to ship water. So you've got better your carbon footprint's better because you're shipping less product. You're not using single use plastics. So to begin with, we're already getting e more eco-friendly and cheaper just for using a concentrated product. But then it gets even better than that because they're designed for continuous use. They're less scented, so they're better for you. Um, and you haven't got all your VOCs. Yeah, we've been talking about this in the last podcast, haven't we? So if you listen to the last one, we're going to repeat ourselves a little bit here. Volatile organic compounds, just in case you didn't hear us on the last one. Yeah, nasty things. They're not nasty. They actually are naturally occurring in, in a lot of our, um, our what well, they are. They're just that. But when they're in a product, they're not natural and they can have a serious effect on us long term. And we spray it into the air. So when you spray it all over the bathroom and breathe it in, because it's impossible not to once you're in a shower, this is really damaging our lungs. So yeah. Please don't bring it in. But then it comes back to if you're going to use unscented products, you're going to need to explain to the customer that I'm using unscented products for your safety, for my safety. Now, the next step in professional products, eco-friendly. Is there any reason now why you wouldn't choose to use eco-friendly products? No, because, you know, well, I remember when I first started the cleaning business and I actually managed to find a manufacturer of really good um, plant based products. But a lot of the eco friendly stuff that was available then wasn't very good. I tried them all. They were rubbish. And now they are so much better. And actually now all of the product suppliers are providing products with better green credentials, shall we say. And some are actually going the, the way above and beyond, aren't, we, aren't they? Yeah. So I'm just testing out at the moment probiotic products. I really like I've actually been trying probiotic products for a few years now. I really like them because there's less risk. There's less nasties in them. Um, it meets, you know, your vegan friendly. And I don't actually does it meet vegan? I don't know if it does, actually. But it meets a lot of the criteria of your eco friendly products. Um, and you can't over dilute it, uh, sorry, over concentrate it as well, because nothing happens if you add just a few more bacteria on there. 
And so I'm loving the probiotics. And I think when it came in, we were going, can we move it into the cleaning industry? Because how do I explain to my customer that I'm covering their house in bacteria? Yes, it's good bacteria that can outcompete the bad bacteria. But I think we really need to be looking at these because much like antibiotics, a lot of these cleaning chemicals that we have relied on in the past are becoming a little bit less effective because what they do is they kill the vast majority of the pathogens. So the strongest are surviving. So actually what you're getting is, is the stronger ones, which are then have gotten less competition and are doing better. So what we do want is actually the bacteria are, are doing a lot better job and stopping those from reproducing and becoming stronger. Yeah, and there's been a lot of research, hasn't there, about this, the, the move towards pre-COVID antibacterial um, cleaning products was all the rage when it, then it became antiviral after COVID. But actually, the fact that we're, they're removing all the good bacteria as well, aren't they? Whereas the probiotic is sort of works, just works differently, doesn't it? It's not destroying it them. Yeah. And I think the other problem with the antibacterial and antiviral, and, you know, we talked about the rates that you were testing them to and how many and I think we've taken it out of our presentation. We Ours was very, yeah, the kill rate. So we talked about this during COVID times. We were very much teaching biohazard at that stage. And I don't think we need to know that rate, those now. And we've taken it out of the presentation. But the reality is, even if I killed absolutely everything on a surface, on my, on my desk in front of me here, we got rid of absolutely everything, which would be very, very challenging and very, very expensive. But if I did... It'd be reinfected from the air about 20 minutes later. So yeah. what is the point? Unless, and again, the residual efficacy, we don't really need to talk about this here, but some products have residual efficacy. So once you cover that surface, if more bacteria then continue to land on it, it will then continue to kill them for a certain amount of time, depending on the product. So, so I didn't need to bring that up, actually. But yes, it wouldn't work necessarily unless it had some kind of residual efficacy, in which case it would work. Most would be reinfected. And most of the things you buy in the supermarkets, what's the point? It's not going to work and kill everything. The probiotics, they're different because they carry on working, don't they, on the surface? So what you're doing is it's much like your yakult. So let's say I covered my surface in probiotics. I'm covering it in bacteria. So what that's going to do is compete. We're going to outcompete the other bacteria that's already on there because we're basically swamping good bacteria. So they're eating all the food. I'm trying to do it in a really simple way. Eating all the food. They... They then outcompete the bad bacteria, which then means that all you've got is exactly what you had before, covered in bacteria, but we're choosing the bacteria. Things. So it's not antibacterial at all. It's the opposite. Mm -hmm. And I suppose for somebody like, you know, I'm in rural France, we have a, a septic tank. And actually those sort of products are perfect because they don't interrupt the process of what's happening in the septic tank, which I don't really want to talk about on a podcast. But, you know, I, we can't use some of the more strong, the stronger chemicals because they would stop that working. No. So what this would do is fill it with more bacteria, I don't know what would happen in a septic tank. I'm not an expert on this. Would it outcompete them in a septic tank? I would imagine you've got so many bacteria and the concentration rates you'd be putting in there would probably have not a lot of effects. No, and, and it might also be helping it break down anyway because we, we put enzymes in ours. So it's probably a similar process. I'll need to do some more research on that, but I know that they're safe to use in, in the septic tanks. So. Oh, oh, you're the expert. I don't have a septic tank and no one around here really has them. And so we were on professional chemicals. Yes. Anyway, so professional chemicals, they're cheaper, they're safer, they are often more eco-friendly. It's a no-brainer. The downside of professional chemicals is that because you're buying them in concentrate, they're often more expensive. But what I'm loving, and the ones I've just bought are in one litre bottles, and it cost me, I think I paid slightly more, so about four, £14 for one litre that's going to make up 100 spray bottles. Wow. P. I'm hesitating, going, I am doing my maths right here. It's 14p per bottle, isn't it? Now, I did feel the bottles I bought were a bit expensive at £3 a bottle. But even so, even if we add that in, that's a, add another 0.3p. So it's costing me 4p a bottle. Well, if you can beat that from your supermarket products, fantastic. But you know, even when they're on special offer, you're looking at the best part of a pound, aren't you? So, yeah, price wise, they just don't compare. And actually, this that's this is a that probiotic eco friendly range, isn't it as well? So, you know, that they're they're safe, they're effective, they're not going to damage the environment. And actually, the company that you, you lime supply, because they're, they're a DCBM, one of the DCBM partner suppliers, 
they have really good credentials as well, don't they, on an eco side? So they have a really good range of products. So they're a reseller. And what they do, and I love Lime Supply for this, and when the, one of the first suppliers in the market to do it, they rate every product against various eco credentials. And so you can go on the website and... I think there's a lot of greenwashing, right? So I'm talking about products, but really we don't tend to push you towards any particular products because we know there's a lot of ranges out there. So what I like about Lime Supply is they cover a lot of the market and they rate them. So you can make the choices as to what's going to work best for you and really understand the products you're looking at. And I love that. It, just yeah, it was interesting, actually, at the BICS conference that we were at last year, they were talking about chemicals, they were talking about environmentally friendly, but they also did bring up greenwashing, didn't they, that we have to be aware um, of what is green and what perhaps isn't as green as you think it is just by looking at a label. And yes, yeah, so it's, it's a big topic in our industry from the sort of big commercial companies and, and domestic. It's a really big topic in our industry right now. And that's why I quite like Lime Supply because they've done the research into it with their supplier. That being said, we have other suppliers and I know Avika do Jangro, what's it called? Natural, natural? Yes, it's, it's natural. It's- natural yeah um and then we've got we've got simple hygiene solutions their products they sell they sell vegan friendly products so theirs are environmentally friendly too and then we've got um Ducris and domestic supplies yeah i, I call them Ducris because i don't know i don't know how to pronounce it sorry gary yeah so they, they've got a whole range as well so we've got some really good suppliers and actually you know that's the key here i think with professional products is having good suppliers that you can literally ask them what should I use for this? And I think you, you're not going to get that with a supermarket where you go in and you ask some lovely 19 year old, what do I use to clean this? They're not going to have a clue, are they? Whereas actually using a professional supplier, they are going to know the answer and they'll they'll often let you have a sample or they'll just give you the advice as to which product to use where. And I just can't see now why you wouldn't be using your environmentally friendly, your natural products. They're so easy. And we, I know we just talked about your natural products and making your own, which we often say don't do. You can if you want to, but don't do it unless you know what you're doing. But if you go to any supplier, as you said, why wouldn't you? It's just a no brainer. Just go get cheaper products and you can phone them up. So you don't have to go to a local supplier. All of these and the reason why we choose our partners, they all ship next day delivery all around the UK, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. So we we only choose the best supplier, partner suppliers for our members. And of course, our members get a good discount, which always helps soften the blow, doesn't it? And, you know, I I didn't get the DCBN discount. I'm an idiot. That's why when I was quoting the prices, I was like, no, oh, didn't even. I'm an idiot. But yes, so I bought them and I'm sure they'll give me a discount on the next batch. But uh, I only bought three bottles. I wanted to test it out because uh, when I'm thinking of moving, actually, this particular range. So I've got, what's it called? Bina. Biohygiena. Anyway, so this is the probiotics one that I'm testing. But what I love, I'm moving from what do I use? I am diversity, don't I? Diversity. I use diversity. And we have five different products. And what I'm loving is it will shrink our range down to three different products. And one of the biggest problems for me is actually my staff, they hate carrying heavy products and getting a bad bag. If I can shrink the range that we're using and I can cut out some of that really liquid weight that they're carrying, it's a real no brainer for me. And that's one of the other reasons I'm really considering it a smaller product range. Yeah. And and I think that as cleaners, because we get a bit excited about cleaning products sometimes, I think, you know, I've seen not in my team, but, you know, I've seen cleaners cars where they're just full of cleaning products. And it's just like, wow, do you really need all of those? And they're like, well, it's just in case, just in case. Or uh, it was on offer. So I bought loads of it. And actually, we only need we we, we only have five products total. Um, and yeah, moving to three makes sense, doesn't it? But even at five, we would probably have half as many as most people. <laughs> Yeah. And and this is the one thing I think you really notice the difference of people that have thought through their products and people that are just starting out. If they are just starting out, honestly, they have hundreds. And it's strange. The more you get to know, you'd think it would be the opposite, wouldn't you? But the more you get to know, the less you use. Yeah. Things we used to use are no longer in our kit. You know, gradually it's just been honed down to this is your maintenance kit. That's all you need. Yeah, definitely. And do you think that's because you're talking about a maintenance kit? Do you think we move products into a deep clean kit and so they come out of our maintenance kit and then we go, okay, there's this great big vat of a deep clean kit and we can cover everything under the sun. 
But do you think when people first start out, they think they have to do everything and actually they're over cleaning houses? Yeah, I yeah, completely. And and definitely guilty of that in the early years in my business. Yeah, there was so much stuff in our kit. I don't know how we managed to carry it around. <laughs> And the one thing I would like as well, that I'd really like, um, I'm not sure if it's even for this podcast, I wish that manufacturers of fixtures and fittings, right? So these lovely black sinks, these lovely brass and gold taps. For goodness sake, when they get lime scale, what a nightmare. You can't use hot products on them. I just wish that manufacturers would think about cleaning, but then they wouldn't sell as well, so... No, and I suppose they don't care if they get damaged because you'll just have to buy new ones a bit more often. Over the years, I've seen so many wrong surfaces in houses, whether it's black taps or whether it's real slate tiles in a shower cubicle or unsealed limestone floors in a kitchen. I've just seen so many awful surfaces and I didn't know until I started what problems they cause and you know when you've got a red wine stain on your lovely cream limestone kitchen floor and it's like that's not coming off it's sink it's sunk in it's porous or the lime the, you know, the slate tiles in the shower cubicle that are all now orange and green and that's kind of what's meant to happen to the, the slate as the water hits it but i can't clean it off so can I tell you a little gem that I learned? And I haven't actually shared this with you. I don't know if you're interested. So do a lot of your customers, I have to say this right, and I'm not sure it's the right way, but the other way is quite embarrassing. Do your customers ask you to use on their wooden floors a product called Bonner? Yes, and I've heard of it. I've not been, we've not been asked to use it because we would always. the answer would always be no, but yeah. It, so we get asked to use this quite often by people. We have a lot of customers that put in new floors. They spend a lot on their houses and they spend equally as much on cleaning. And uh, I laugh because if you pronounce it another way, I've had very. It was highly... really lovely, well pronounced. Yeah, saved our blushing. B O N A. So you can call it Bonner. Or I had a great discussion once with a lady about her husband's boner. Anyway, the point is, it's a brilliant product for cleaning your floors. And I was talking about this with a product manufacturer. And I was like, it's ridiculous. It's really hard because actually it doesn't work with the way we mop the floors. It can only be used certain ways and it's incredibly expensive. And I said, why? What is so amazing about this product? And he told me that the reason it's recommended on floors is because they've spent a lot of money testing it. So it works well and maintains those floors. And if you don't use that product on your floors, then it invalidates the maintenance. Now, it doesn't mean it doesn't have exactly the same ingredients as the alternative products that we might be supplying. But our products haven't been tested on it. And I was like, so I could have the same product. And that's why they want to use it, which that I it suddenly made sense to me why they are making everyone get this product and what a marketing ploy get your product tested on this floor this type of floor and it's often whereas every type of wooden floor quite frankly seems to be recommended to use this how brilliant is that from a marketing point of view from a cleaner's point of view I'm like this is ridiculous yeah. do you think also the people that are installing the floor are kind of covering themselves a little bit and kind of going well did you use the project we recommended no I'm sorry not my what problem yeah and you know I know I've had that when people clients say I've had Antico or Candine and they've said oh we've been told we have to use this and it's like it's fine you supply it we'll we'll use it I'll, I'll get the safety data sheet for it not a problem but I'm just like anything will work on it it's you know it's a, a really actually a really durable floor but it's the it's the warranty isn't it that's important yeah, which is ridiculous because, and again, I have this problem with a lot of people that get like marble work surfaces and granite work surfaces. So the reason they get granite work surfaces is because it's one of the hardest rocks on earth. So they get the most durable work surface that's going to outlive them. And the list of instructions I get given to maintain <laughs> the hardest product on freaking earth do you know what you want me to do here? You have polished granite. There's not much I'm going to do to wreck it as long as I'm not using some of the, you know, I could even use abrasive products, which would probably be fine. But as long as I'm not using bleach based ones, they're going to be fine. Yeah, although you do see, and I don't know whether it's because it's, it's maybe not as good quality granite, but you do see the the rings on them, don't you? Sitting down. Sometimes it's, it's they put something down that's maybe a bit acidic and yeah, it's it's left a ring, hasn't it? But yeah, we just wash them and then dry them. They want it polished. And I'm like, look, a good cloth done properly is going to polish that up yeah. just as well as me spraying, quite frankly, your polymers all over it. Like, do we need that? 
Yeah, there actually used to be a really good floor cleaner out there um, that made, well, I say a good floor cleaner. It was a floor cleaner that would make your floors look good, whether it was a good floor cleaner or not, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to say the name because it's actually a really good brand. But that had silicon in the floor cleaner to make your laminate and wooden floors shiny. And do you still use it or do you not because it's got silicon? Yeah. I think... I, it was one of the products I bought when I first started. It was It's a professional product, but actually it's not one I would use now. And the problem is, and this is why you need to understand it and look at your safety data sheets, because if you use that product on stairs and someone slides down it, you're now liable. And this has happened in our groups, hasn't it? They've used a product like that and they go, well, I've never had problems in the past. And they might have just changed the um, ingredients or the concentration slightly. And as soon as someone slips down, you're kind of liable because you didn't know it was a silicon based product that you used on their wooden stairs. Yeah, exactly. So no, not, not, it might made them, it look made them look amazing. And I'm tempted to use it on my kitchen floor because it's wooden and it's really like scuffed and it would bring it up nicely. But yeah, somebody might break their neck in their home. I'm not going to risk that. So we haven't discussed masks. So that's probably our last thing to touch on. I've certainly still got boxes of flipping masks. Those surgical masks that we all had to wear during COVID. I've got loads of them left over, even though you couldn't get them for love nor money at first. What do we think of masks nowadays? So, right, let's talk through surgical masks. I, I'm rolling my eyes because I hate this subject now. But so surgical masks are designed so that if you sneeze, then it is stopped. And basically, I think it stops something. It's pretty good. It's like 80, 85 percent of your sneeze is now not going to go into the air. It's really, really good. How much does it protect you from someone else's sneeze not in a mask? I think it gives you something stupid, like five or 10 percent protection it does not protect you from breathing things in because they're just going straight around that mask. A surgical mask, I can see why it was useful in COVID if everyone wore them, which they didn't, by the way. Um, so, but if you're a cleaner and you need to be protected from your mold remover, your lime scale remover, your toxic product in some way, it is not protecting you whatsoever because you're just going to breathe it straight in. So, and we go through this in length and there's different ratings of masks, which I'm, I'm not going to do it now because you need pictures. It works a lot better. Um, you need, really, I'd be going to Screw Fix. It's probably the easiest place to go to your builder's merchants. Go and get a better grade mask. So your FFP2 um, or 3, depending on your product, get one that actually at least molds around your face at the very least. But your safety data sheet will tell you what kind of face protection you need. And if you're sending your staff off with mold spray or lime scale removal, which is the two of the major guilty culprits, then you need to provide masks. And if you're using it yourself, you definitely need to use masks. And goggles. And goggles, yes. And not the goggles with the holes in the side, the ventilation holes. So, yeah, you need to research the right type of mask. If you want to know more details, come on our course. If you're a DCBM member, watch the presentation. There's an awful lot more. We go through it for two hours and not just chatting about it like we have now. It's full on hardcore fact, fact, fact. This is how you need to stay safe. This was adapted from a biohazard course initially. And we basically took biohazard in COVID times and we applied it specifically to the domestic cleaning industry. So this is almost taking your biohazard for domestic cleaners. Admittedly, we have stripped a little bit out and scaled it back a little bit now. Um, but we believe everybody needs this training in order to clean safely. You need to understand this basics and we're putting it on for free. Absolutely. And we we paid. So the person that did our biohazard training for us, we paid her, didn't we, to consult on this course for us to create it originally during COVID to try. Actually, it was when we were all going back to work to see if we could train people to go back to work safely, wasn't it, at the time? And like you say, it's evolved now and it's a, it's a standalone course that basically helps everybody clean safely, with, regardless of COVID, because when we're out cleaning in domestic houses, we are coming across biohazards and we do need to protect ourselves and others and every part that we've mentioned in here when you're using chemicals like you, you know these are biohazards when you're cleaning out dirty toilets they are biohazards that you are coming across and a lot of people think oh i don't do biohazard jobs well yeah you do yes you do in every job you do now admittedly we're not selling them as biohazard jobs because you're not coming across well you are coming across bodily fluids aren't you so you need this at least basic biohazard knowledge. So we believe every cleaner should have this training, which is why we have literally put it on for free live 
if you're listening to this afterwards, we're possibly not putting on another live one for another few months. Do we sell it as a standalone course or is it just included in membership? We don't, but I've actually been asked quite a lot about it recently. So it might be something. We've got nearly 160 people booked onto the live one. So we're hopefully getting the message out there. But yeah, there's always a call for somebody to watch it afterwards because they're busy and putting the kids to bed or out working. So our 0 to 50k course, which is a standalone course, it is included in there because I did the whole lot on that one. It took me ages to get that one done. So we re-recorded it and it is in the 0 to 50k, which you can buy as a standalone course. And that's really for anyone starting out. It covers all your basics and not just health and safety. It covers the financials. It covers how to set up your business. Everything up until taking on your first employee, it does not cover that. But it covers everything you need in starting a business, including marketing, financials everything so we need to go off and get ready for our presentation that we're about to do on this course um thank you very much diane if anybody would like to know more details about joining the dcbn you can message either of us on facebook or go on www.dcbn.org.uk thank you very very much and we look forward to seeing you soon at the awards